Okay, this is Dennis Gill with the Americans of Wartime Museum. Today's date is 25 September 2021, and I am the 2021 Tank Farm Open House interviewing Richard Shelton. That's right. So I appreciate you sitting down and talking to us today. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? That kind so of thing. So I'm an, I'm an Air Force brat. Okay. Um, I grew up and started out in, in Kansas City, Missouri. That's where I was born. Uh, my dad was stationed at Richard's Gabor. He was a uh, 130 pilot. He was transitioning from 86s to C-130s, and then we went to uh, Evreu, France. And so as a, as a small child, back in the early 60s, we lived there. Then we moved to Seward Air Base in Tennessee, and then Dad got orders to Vietnam, and it was they were closing the base at that time. And Mom said, we're going back to Denver. You've only got like two years to your, tw to your, to your 20th until you can retire. So. Uh, we settled back in Denver and waited for him to finish out the rest of his tour. Okay. So, and what branch of the service did you serve in? I served in the Army. Okay. Uh, why did you decide to serve and why the Army? Why not follow your dad's footsteps? Um, the, I, I came close to going to the Air Force, but the, to me, the, the ability to start leading and working with soldiers or service members at an earlier point in my career starts in the Army, either that or the Marine Corps. You know, it's, it's, it's that leadership, it's that, um, you know, things that, you know, when I was a Boy Scout, I always wanted to be a patrol leader, that kind of a thing. So I always thought I was good at that kind of, of uh, functions, doing, doing, doing those kind of things, getting groups together, organizing, getting everybody on the same sheet of music, and moving toward a common goal. I thought I was pretty good at that. So the Army offered the best opportunity to start that under the under the best conditions right. and so I became an armor officer um, because I didn't like walking. <laughs> <laughs> My legs are too short for that. Right. Five foot right. seven I'm not gonna yeah. not gonna enjoy walking yeah. 20 miles at a time although I did it start out as an enlisted man in a light infantry battalion which even further confirmed my uh, suspicion that I did not like walking a whole right. lot. Right. So. In addition to your father, do you have any other members of your uh, family that are military? So my uncle, he, he's, he's since passed away, but he was a uh, he was in he was in the Navy during the Korean War. So if you ever see the movie Bridge of Tokori, okay, Bridge of the Tokori, that was the carrier my uncle was on. The Oriskany. Okay. And he 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 got he can he didn't he didn't he just did his one enlistment. Came back to the uh, came back to Denver and spent the rest of his life there. So, okay. yeah. Okay. And did you have any idea what you wanted to do in the army? Was there any career path that you thought? Um, I wanted to. I, I knew I wanted to be a combat arms officer, so I did not want to be someone who um, you know I didn't want to be a supply officer, didn't want to be an intelligence officer, um, because I you know the leadership is different. The, the, the task of the leadership is, is different. Um, when it came to being an arm officer, the leadership, you, you're one-on-one -on -one with the guys who are going to do the fighting. It's what we call direct fire combat. So it's uh, the armor and the infantry are the two branches that do that. Back when I was in, it was the Cold War was still going on. So uh, being an armor guy, getting on the newest tanks, the M1A ones, um, what was the sexiest thing you could do? <laughs> you know, you, 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 got, uh, you got responsibility early on. Right. Um, you got challenges early on. And so that was, uh, that was, that was what I wanted to do. You, and you got to work with, you know, for an, an armor platoon is a relatively small organization in the Army, 16 people total. So, you know, you, you work with each of your crew members and, and each of the tank crews, and you get your stuff together. Go out there and do it. So it was fun. Was, a lot of fun. was there anything that you so you talked about leadership that you mm. were naturally drawn to that? Is there mm. any any one moment that you said I'm, I I can be a leader when you were younger that that pointed you in that direction? Um, something you felt. You know, that, that's interesting. I think it was something I felt because I never um, really sought a lot of leadership positions in in high school. I thought that was you know junior high and high school that was more of a popularity contest right. than an actual kind of, okay, you, you know, you've got to make some tough decisions given certain circumstances. Um, 
probably a little bit in the Boy Scouts. I, I got to do that, you know, as patrol leader and stuff like that. Yeah. And then uh, I was a, a den chief too, so I got to, you know, round up a bunch of what were they? I was what, 15, 16, and they were 12, 11 year old boys, and just trying to kind of get them all on the same sheet of music. So I don't know. It was just it was in me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe, maybe it's because I'm short and uh, in the Napoleon complex right. or something like that. But uh, don't let that get out. Edit that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, where did you enter military service? You said you were enlisted originally. Yeah, so I entered military service from Denver, went to Fort Lewis, Washington with uh, 4th of the 23rd Infantry. Um, was in 11 Charlie, which is in Mortarman. And in a light infantry battalion, the Mortarmen get to carry the mortars, which isn't fun. <laughs> so everybody else is on 25 mile road march and you're on 25 mile road march with your mortar uh, so yeah I did, that was the end of infantry for me I was like I'm never doing this again right. um, but it was also I learned some stuff because I was in at a time when there was still Vietnam, Vietnam War veterans there and I, I remember one time we were the platoon leader had called all the section leaders together and we were eating chow and he was talking about the next mission and I got up to do something and I walked away from my rifle and he lost his mind. He said, you never ever walk away from your rifle. He was, um, he was a really great guy. He was a tall Canadian and he said he went to Vietnam and joined the American Army because he was tired of Americans coming to Canada. <laughs> so anyway, he taught me, you know, that was, you know, he taught us a lot of those very core lessons that, you know, of, of basic, basic soldiering. You know, never leave your weapon out. It doesn't leave your hands until you put it back in the arms. That was that. Because you may need it and not be able to get to it. And so I was like, yeah, that's, that, that's good. And he taught us, you know, keep your body in good physical condition. The better physical condition you're on, the, the more you'll be able to stand the pressures of operations. Not just combat, but operations because Army gr ground operations, there's, there's no such thing as crew rest. You're going to go until you either accomplish the objective, run out of gas, need to stop for refueling or something like that. Otherwise, you just keep going. And that was, that was what Desert Storm was. I mean, we just drove until we were, you know, basically a place where we could get gas. So if that was 18 hours, that was 18 hours. You know. And you can't fall asleep on any of it because you're out in the middle of the desert, and back then, not everybody had GPS. So now you're navigating by, there were times when we literally navigated by knowing the tracks of the vehicles that we were following. Okay, so we're supposed to be following these five Bradleys. That's a Bradley track, that's a Bradley track, that's, okay, there's five of them. Stay on this course. And that was, uh, that was interesting. How long were you enlisted? I was enlisted, two years, two years. Two years, and I went to OCS. And so. Did you plan to go to OCS at some point? Oh yeah, oh yeah, all, 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 it was always my plan to go to OCS. Okay. Always my plan. How are things different from enlisted to an officer? In your experience. Oh boy, that's, that's a, no one has ever asked me that question before. So um, give me a second to think. The bigger picture, and, it, and that becomes as you move up the ranks, an infantryman has to do the fight that he has. And so it's, it's, it's tactics. Tactical thought is, is the thing that you are focused on. As you move up the ranks, as a combat arms officer, you start having to think deeper and deeper into it. So as an infantryman, we, you know, the enemy is in front of me, that's where I have to get to. I have to get to this one objective. As an armor officer, I've got to think about this objective, the next objective, the gas I have to get to the next objective, the gas and ammo I have when I get there, and I have to make that call before I start moving because that, all that stuff takes time to get to me. I don't want to get to that objective and no gas, no ammo. Yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a, a pillbox. Right. <laughs> you know, so. so it sounds like the level of responsibility is just magnitudes greater as an officer. Um, for other guys. As you get to the senior NCO ranks, and so, I mean, I relied on my senior NCOs because I had some very good ones. I, I as, as a troop commander, I had three of the best first sergeants I've ever seen. 
Um, I didn't do their business. I let them do their business, and they did it well. Never had to worry about fuel, gas, ammo, none of the stuff I had, none of those things that you have to worry about um, that I have to worry about because of those guys. All those guys made Sergeant Major. One of them went on to be the Force Comm Sergeant Major, which is, uh, you know, if it, he would have been the Force Comm Commander, that would have been the equivalent of a four-star command. So he was, he, he was, he was a fast burner. Um, I learned to listen to those guys. I learned to listen to those guys because, um, you know, that, that's not saying I didn't have some dirt bag in sales. You know, some of them just didn't cut it. And, and in a unit that's a, a, as autonomous as a cavalry unit is, where, you know, the, in, the enemy is out in front of you. You go out there to find the enemy. And the, the heavy forces may be significantly behind you. So, you know, you've, you've got to be able to do everything pretty much by yourself. And uh, so that was, that was, a, that was a, a point that I, that I, you know, tried to instill in my soldiers was, hey, look, guys, you know, when we go out there, we're going to be, it's going to be us. It's going to be us, and there ain't going to be a whole lot of other folks to help us. So we're going to go out and do our mission, but we're going to be able to do it, you know, because we're well trained at it. And uh, my soldiers, soldiers like to train. They don't like to do other things. Um, I guess it's playing with the toys. <laughs> if you want to go back to what, what it is, it's boys playing with toys. And, uh, yeah, they, they like that. And so if you can keep them focused on that, you know, you, your time as a, as a commander is probably going to be pretty good. Yeah. Your combat experience is Desert Storm, correct? Desert Storm. I was on the tail end of OIF. By that time, I had transitioned to being... You guys have in the Air Force, too, operations research guys. Um, but I was working at a place where we did a lot of combat analysis. So for OIF, it was literally within two weeks of, of them being in Baghdad, it was go out and figure out everything that happened, how it happened, how what we've done, and how we portray combat in our combat models is either correct, not correct, bring all that information back. So that was a lot of interviews, a lot of, you know, sitting down with guys in Baghdad talking about this, that, and the other thing. Going out to where they fought the battles and looking and seeing, interesting enough, the Iraqis actually did adjust for some of the things that we had done during Desert Storm. They had picked up on some of the ways we fought and they had made some adjustments. And that was important to note to get that back to, you know, the Army so the Army can say, hey, next time we, if we have to fight somebody like this again, they may use these tactics. And it was also important to get that back so that we could then, we do a lot of war gaming and simulation uh, for all kind of operations, and you want, to, you want that to be accurate. So when, you know, when, when a three-star or a two-star says, hey, how am I going to do in this fight? You want to be able to say, boss, here's, here's, here's how it plays out. Here's how it could play out. So look at these certain things, strength, weaknesses, things you need to be concerned about. And that can be as simple as a tabletop war game or it can be an advanced computer war game. So that was, that was how I ended my career doing stuff like that. And that was, that was worthwhile, I think. Yeah. That was worthwhile. So. What rank are you in um, Desert Storm? I was a captain. captain. What, uh, what, what was the captain responsible for? So I had an interesting job in Desert Storm. I wasn't a troop commander yet. Uh, I was the squadron maintenance officer for the 2nd Squadron 3rd ACR. So what we had to do was, we had, uh, I can't, can't do the numbers, but we had some, some number of, of there was nine tanks in a, in a troop, so do the math real quick, and I hate doing math in public, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, about 130 something combat vehicles. Okay. So. And they all break. So I, me and a crew of my chief warrant officer, we had to follow a battalion. Now the, the squadron did not did not sit still. I mean, we moved the first. I think we moved for the first twenty-eight to thirty-six hours. We did nothing but move. During that time, stuff is breaking. Now I'm going to mention his name. Tom Talon is a great man because he was my chief maintenance officer. And before we left, he said, Smo, that's what they call me, squadron maintenance officer. 
we're going to take all the equipment, all the, all the, Tom had tracked what breaks on tanks, what breaks on Bradleys, what breaks on 113s. He said, we're going to grab all that stuff. He said, the other squadrons aren't doing that. We're going to grab it all. So we still, we acquisitioned all of these extra parts. And so we kept the squadron running because things would break. Like, you can't use a tank when the gun sight goes out. And so it's a thermal imaging gun sight. So if that thermal imager goes down, the tank is, you know, he's left with the same sights the T-72s had. And so we didn't want that, so we, we had extra thermal imagers. We were able to keep everything running. Um, and that was, you know, that was a, that was a hard push. The, the squadron did get some con contact when we got up to Basra, outside of Basra. We hit an airfield and there was some fighting going on there. We suffered no combat losses at that time. Um, we didn't lose any vehicles. But we did lose, uh, the thing that we hadn't planned on was because they had, because it was an airfield, there were a lot of cluster munitions on the airfield because the Air Force had seeded it, of course. So it couldn't be used as an airfield. Well, a lot of them just sat there in the sand until you ran over them. <laughs> and then poof! And then you blow a track off of a vehicle and you have to put it back on. Right. So, so there was, we were almost ran out of track. That was, the, that was the biggest challenge we faced at that time. And then, you know, um, because we had all the vehicles and, and all the space, we had to take all the POWs from the airfield back to a, a POW camp. And then that was the end of that one. Uh, so, and then we just waited around to get home. <laughs> so the Army, well, the military in general, they hadn't fought uh, to that level mm -hmm. since Vietnam. Right. And, and the enemy that they had prepared for was the Soviets mm -hmm. in the jungles. Right. How, how prepared was the Army for a, a mission in, in the desert, you know, with a bunch of guys that had never seen combat? So we were extremely lucky. I was with the 3rd ACR. We were stationed at Fort Bliss, the desert. <laughs> so we knew how to maneuver in the desert. Um, the, squ the squadron commander, Lieutenant Colonel Ed O'Shaughnessy at that time, um, he put us into a, uh, basically a wedge. And that was a beautiful idea. I don't think he, he, he realized how, how, how efficient that was because you had a cav troop, a cav troop, a cav troop, and then the tank company in the center, which he could maneuver so if the cab troop is going to make contact with the enemy because they're scouts, okay? Now he has the ability to maneuver his heavy company to whoever's having the biggest problem. So he can maneuver his, his 14 tanks and basically solve that fight. He also has his artillery behind him. What it gave us, and this was interesting because as the maintenance officer, we were get picking up the broke dick stuff, excuse my language, and we'd have to, we never stopped. We didn't stop for the first I'd say the first four days we did not stop. So we would grab stuff and have to drag it forward. If it was too broken, we'd leave it, but I don't think we only had but a couple of vehicles. But because we were in that wedge, we could always tell, even if we couldn't use the, uh, we were using Loran then, not everybody had pluggers and sluggers and GPS. So we were using Loran and the signal was iffy to say the least. So you had this big map that had no, no, no terrain features on it because right. it's just a big ass desert. And um, because of that wedge, we were able to tell where we were at in the wedge. Okay. Yeah, so you could tell and you say, okay, these are, these are the Bradley tracks, these are the tank tracks, you know, and you could see, hey, look, you know, we, as long as we stayed in that gap, and which was about, probably about maybe two miles wide, we were good. We were good. If we got outside that gap, then we had to call and, and figure out where we were actually at because we moved night and day, so. It was just, you know, try to keep up. Right. But it, we did it, so. And uh, I looked out. I had you, some good so, crew. So you're on the ground during this. When you say maintenance officer, you're not mm. sitting back at a maintenance field somewhere. No, you're no, no. You're actually out there with the tanks as they're moving. Yeah, yeah. We, we fixed them on the, on, them on the run. On the run. Literally on the run. Right. When we got our, so we moved for a day and a half, I think, maybe two days. And we got our first stop. The first time the, 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 the squadron stopped and actually rested for fuel and stuff. We went right, we, we came, and I, I still, you know, I, I'm still very proud of my guys because they were up driving the whole time. They weren't sleep. And so what they did was they came off that and they went straight to, the, to, the, to where everything was broken and started fixing. And if nothing else, they gave the, they gave the mechanics, each of the cab troops has a mechanic section. They gave them what they needed, the parts they needed to fix stuff. 
and meantime, me and uh, Tommy had to run back to get other parts. Everything that we had used up, we had to replenish. So that when we went to the next stage, everybody could be fixed. And uh, it was, um, I put some miles in, <laughs> in the deserts of, of Iraq. I What's the biggest challenge you guys faced? Uh, I don't think it was the Iraqi soldiers as much as it was um, the thing I the thing I think I, I feared the most was fratricide fratricide um, it's not the easiest thing to control fires in an armor unit because everybody's in their own little world and so you're tired it's night a lot of times you're looking through a thermal site and one of the good things about going back to the Germany experience, when there was a wall up, you had to be able to, to be considered a qualified soldier, you did border tours, and you had to be able to identify every Soviet vehicle from all kind of angles, and that was just drilled into you. You couldn't, from private on up to battalion commander, you couldn't do the vehicle ID, your ass didn't go to the border, and that was not a good thing. So, everybody pretty much knew what to look for. Um, but not everybody had been to Germany. And so there were guys who didn't have that level of experience. And um, that, was, um, that, was, that was the thing I worried about. That was the thing I worried about was, because was, we'll, we were running behind everybody in armored vehicles and were dragging tanks. And so, thank goodness, knock on wood, the Air Force never targeted us. <laughs> that was a good thing. Um, but I think, the, I think the, they probably controlled the fireboxes pretty well there. And um, we didn't have any, any, that was never a problem for us. It was never a problem for us. When, we, when the squadron finally made contact, it was daylight, so it was, it was relatively easy and it went, it went fast. It went fast. Yeah, the only thing we had to do, I was back with the medics. The medics were back with us. And when the uh, Iraqis started taking casualties, I, they, you know, I had to bring them all forward, so they were like, okay, get the smoke to bring up the medics, because it's a doc leading the medics, and he doesn't, right. <laughs> he's like, I don't know how to read a map, <laughs> follow me, doc. <laughs> right. yeah, so. What's that like, um, most, you're, you're in a situation that most people will never experience, and that's mm -hmm. combat. Mm -hmm. What's that like the first time you're in combat? And um, it actually gets real. It's not training environment anymore. The thing to do is to, for me, what worked for me was I'm in charge of soldiers. Their lives depend on me. I don't have the luxury of getting and being afraid. You don't have that luxury. You freeze, they die. And you could die. So it's not just you. You've got to always be thinking about that. You've always got to be kind of, I'm here now, this is what I expect. I didn't get that, so what am I going to, what, what do I expect next? Okay, I didn't get that, I've got this, what do I do next? You take time to be scared, you're putting everybody else's life at risk, so don't do that. That's, that's simple as it is, you just don't have the time to be afraid. At least for me, that's the way, that's the way it was for me. You know, and my brother will tell you I'm a coward. <laughs> my older brother will tell you I was afraid to go off the diving board. He had to push me off the diving board. My dad was at right. the pool when he's like, "Go push that boy off the dive, high dive, because he doesn't want to jump." So yeah, yeah. That that was I think the thing that was a, that that uh, was important to me was, you know, you can you can be afraid of things. Uh, you could take a healthy understanding of what the threat is to you. But then you have to act, and you have to keep your soldiers alive, okay? Sometimes that means, you know, hey, what's the mission? We may be able to accomplish it, we may not. But keep your guys alive, and get that fight done if you can. So is it safe to say that there's a job to do, and that occupies your time, and the rest of that stuff, how dangerous it is, the, you know, the peril that your life is in is... Not even a thought anymore because you have a job to do and you're hyper focused on it. 
Yeah, I would say that that's exactly. I, I don't see. I don't see how you get through it without that. If you don't do that, and you let the fear creep up on you, how are you gonna make decisions? And you know, guys are on the radio. What do I do? You know. What am I supposed to do? You know. Okay. You know that's why we have battle drills in the army because you may not have time to tell folks what to do. So it's like, okay, this situation, you do this. And you practice it over and over again, and it seems mundane, but it's, it has to be instinct when, you, when, it, when the time comes. Otherwise, because somebody's in that, in that vehicle scared. You know, if there's four guys in the vehicle, somebody, at least one of y'all is scared, if not all four of you. But you still got to act. Is, is it a surprise? And you know, some people on the outside looking in think, wow, that was a 100-hour war, ground mm -hmm. war at least. You know, easy money. Mm -hmm. um, what, was was it like that, or no? Was it harder than it than people's perception that it was? I, I think it was. We lucked out. We luck. We lucked out because the second time I was in Iraq, I got to interview a bunch of Iraqi senior officers, and they had also fought in Desert Storm. You have to remember the Iraqi army. Th this was a. a I think it was, it was not luck, but fortuitous for us. The Iraqi army had been fighting in, in an Iranian army that had lost most of its mechanization, had took very long time to plan things, and a very long time to execute things. The American army had been trained to fight a massive Soviet army where the one thing you did not have was time. You did not have time. That was. The drills when we were in, in Europe were like, get to the motor park, you know, 30 minutes from the time the alert starts, you're in the motor park, you're ready to roll out. You're two hours away from the border. So all the way to the border, we would, we would roll out and roll to the border, all the way there, you'd be thinking about, okay, if I have to fight here, where am I going to fight this fight, you know? Right. Because if they get to this point, then I have to fight from here because it doesn't make sense to fight from this next piece of terrain. So, yeah, the... Um, the thinking about it and the over the, the over repetitiveness of drills. A lot of people think they're boring. Why are we doing this again? Oh, come on, sir! We just did this for the eighth time because you didn't do it right or you didn't do it quick enough. And so, for example, when I was a troop commander, I expected a well. When I was a platoon leader, we expected we would we would have a, a drill where on our gunnery range we would br they would bring up a Soviet-style tank company. Well, that's a 30-second engagement for, for, for an American tank platoon. 30 seconds, there are 10 tanks out there, you kill all 30 of them, in, all 10 of them in 30 seconds. Don't waste any time with it. You don't have more time than that, because then they'll be starting to kill you. So yeah, that was, that was the goal, was to, to, to get things to be not, not rote memory, but very reactive memory, and then to know the time cycle at which you had to act. And of course, that's you know that's at the tactical level, at the operational level, and at the strategic level. There's always that that time cycle. You, you, you're 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 silly if you think your enemy's not thinking as much as you are, and also on a time cycle. I think the the advantage we had in Desert Storm was the Iraqis just didn't know how fast and how hard we could fight. They they, they I I did not see them as bad soldiers. I saw them as as, as soldiers. And especially the time I went back and, and talked to them, got to talk to the, uh, after OIF, got to, in, got to do interviews with senior Iraqi officers, they weren't bad guys in, in the sense that they weren't untrained, they weren't slovenly, but they were, um, their pace of combat was much slower than ours. And that's, that's, a, that's a fine testament to the way the American Army trained. Uh, we have a we can put it on you real fast. That's 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 the way best way to put it. Put it on you real fast. And with the Air Force, you're not going to have a second chance to, to do anything else because your supplies are cut. You know everything else is gone. So when the army comes, it's it's going to be over quick. And, and that's that's the way we like to fight it. Now, oh, I you know, Afghanistan was that that way? No, totally different type of war. But if if you if you if you engage in the U.S. Army in conventional warfare. It's going to be a tough fight. I, I don't know that there's a force that could do that right now. You found yourself in Iraq again. 
Yeah. Um, after 9-11? After 9-11. What was your role then? So I had, um, I had switched from, I had come out of uh, being an XO of a tank battalion, and back then the Army did this thing where you were, uh, you would go back and forth between a desk assignment, and I was an operations research analyst, and a, 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 a line assignment. So I went and became an operations research analyst at what's called the Center for Army Analysis, and I was put in the, because I was a combat arms officer, I was put in the, the, I was put with the guys who do all the uh, computer war gaming and stuff. So in other words, after 9-11, we worked 24 hours a day shifts for a good month doing stuff, right. <laughs> doing right. stuff, doing stuff. So then after OIF kicked, kicked off, then we went out and said, okay, how did the stuff we did measure up? And right. everything we did was a representation of combat. So all we, the thing for us to get back from it was did we represent it correctly and what has changed? Because if you're going to tell a senior commander, hey look boss, this is the way, way, way it might go down if you war game this, you want to make sure that you have the latest and greatest on how things are going down. And that was that, was that trip. It was uh, real interesting. The, uh, we did it in conjunction with the Army War College. A lot of good findings. Um, Well, I can't talk about all of them, I will say this, from Desert Storm to OIF, the Iraqis had definitely adapted to the way we fight. That's and my uh, next question is, how, what, were, what was different? What did you find different between Lots Gulf of things. Gulf lots of things. They did not, they did not stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with the Army, with an, with an armored force anymore. They, they, they didn't even try that. They had a couple of places where they did, and they had done some things that were very interesting. They had double bermed some of their some of their vehicles. So a double berm is I got a berm right in front of my tank, and the Iraqis always dug them in. And I have a berm 100, 200 meters out in front of my tank. Why would you do that? Because the Americans use laser range finders on their tanks. So if I laser to this one, hit the first berm, I'm not going to hit you. I'm going to shoot you short. So it was just like almost like a decoy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they they. Those, in, those interviews were some of the most interesting things that I, I did in my career was because I got to hear them talk about, you know, how things had changed inside the Iraqi army. They weren't the same Iraqi army that we fought in OIF. You know, the, the, the Saddam did not spend the money on them as much. They didn't get the training. And, you know, that could have been some guys whining. Uh, but yet and still, um, I have to think, yeah, that, that was probably the case. And the fact that whoever was in leadership also chose, hey, look, we're not going to fight these guys, you know, in a conventional warfare anymore. And not, not in that way. We'll use other means to fight them yeah. because we're not going to win that way. So they adapted. They did. Yeah. Well, I mean, any, any, any enemy is going to adapt. Right. If you're in a boxing ring with somebody, he's going to adapt to you or you're going to knock him out. Right. <laughs> you know, so any wrestling match, you know, everybody adapts. You just, that's, I think that's the, that's I, that's probably the hardest thing to, to to for me to get at the at the tactical operational level. Your enemy is always going to adapt. It's not the same fight that you had before, and I think you know the army's probably doing a good job of adapting its training to say, hey, look, this fight is differently, different now. And you know, I I wonder now with drones and everything else and and UAVs, how has that fight changed? How does air superiority look now when, when people have drones? Why would, I, why would I spend 20, 30, 40 million dollars on a high-speed fighter airplane that I know the F-15 and the F-22 are just going to knock from the sky right. at, the, at the second I take them off off the runway because they're going to know I'm taking them off the runway? Why would I do that if I can attack your weaknesses with drones? Yeah. So, you know, for the future, the challenges out there. I, th I think that this, the Department of Defense will be challenged in peacetime over the next 
20 years, probably more so than it has been challenged previously. Because maybe we're moving away from industrial warfare. Maybe, I mean, if I can cripple your banking through the internet, have I not hurt your country? Right. Have I not achieved? Maybe you want to do something, and if I say, hey, this is what's going to happen, if you do that, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can twist your arm without ever having to fire a shot. So I think that's, that's the biggest challenge. The thing that worries me is what does the next generation of warfare look like? There will probably, unfortunately, always be some type of struggle between powers. We're human beings. We do that. Um, how will it shape out, and are we, the United States, ahead of that curve? Because we need to be. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting analysis. A lot yeah. of people don't think about it. Yeah. yeah. You have, you've had time to look back on it now. How do you think your wartime experience has uh, shaped or affected your life? In um, I'm not the same person who thought one step ahead of where he was. I think that's, that's the biggest thing that's, that's affected my life is um, I always try to think two and three steps ahead because I'm older now and I have to, right. <laughs> but but you know it, it, that 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 way of that way of thinking. Then do I have everything I need to do what I want to do? You know, so it's this that that iterative planning loop that you develop in the military because you do so much planning, and people are like God, planning's boring. No, planning planning isn't everything. It's how you react to it. Right. But if you don't plan, then you don't know how to react, or you do react in the wrong way, and so. Hey, uh, I think that was that's that's what's kind of shaped me is that ability to do that and you know stay in shape. <laughs> yeah, stay in shape. You want to look good as you get older. <laughs> so one of the missions of this project mm. is to record and and preserve stories like yourself. Mm. We want someone in a hundred years to see this story and, and get something out of it. What right. message you want to send somebody who might watch us a century from now? Wow. Not to get too deep. Huh. So if I were to talk to Joe Civilian a hundred years from now, I would say, I pray that the world is a peaceful place for your generation. You should be prepared for it not to be. That would, that would be what I'd say. You should be prepared for it not to be because human beings are competitive. Resources hundred years from now, what resources, we don't even know what resources people will be using a hundred years from now. But if they're scarce, then, you know, humans are humans. There's going to be some issues, and if you're not planning and not a step ahead of your peer competitors, I hate to say it, you know, humans, like I said, humans are competitive. I would love to see peace and flowers across the whole world and everybody living in harmony. I doubt it. I really do. I, and that's sad. You know, I got kids. I would love for them to have, not to worry about a, a war at all during a lifetime. But, yeah, it may be I, the, the thing I'm really worried about is what is the nature of that combat going to be? It may not be industrial combat anymore. And if it's not, have we, have we turned this, the, the tide and made the changes necessary in the Department of Defense and in our government to adjust to that type of combat? We don't have another Pearl Harbor to take us, you know, and, and, and what, three and a half years to gin up for an industrial war? That, that, that time is not going to be there. I, I really don't feel like that time will be there. I feel like what will happen is it will be something very quick and then you'll have to adjust to the will of somebody else. And that would be unfortunate. Yep. Well, on behalf of the award, America's Wartime Experience, I thank you for right. sitting down and talking to us. I appreciate uh, you letting me run my mouth yeah. for a long time. That's all right. <laughs> and uh, more importantly, I thank you for your service to your country. Oh, no problem. It's great no problem. patriots like you that give mm -hmm. us the freedoms we have. Oh, thank we you. We appreciate it.